Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the Shane Anything Podcast. It's Doug Williams with Keith Hernandez this week. Keith, it's been uh, it's been a couple weeks. You're down in Florida now. Uh, you've escaped the cold weather. Yes. How how's how's it going down there? Well, it's just getting settled in. Um, starting to see my car my chiropractor uh, twice a week. That uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the 172 mile round trip. I didn't realize how important going on a road trip was because you broke up that drive and just get on a bus in 15 minutes you're at the ballpark so my back's been a little sore it just needs to get moved a little bit and i'll be fine the weather's wonderful haji's very happy good so uh, those are the important things and uh, i i know the answer to this because we talked for a couple minutes before we started taping you have not necessarily been locked in on the postseason baseball that does not include the Mets in your off time. I have not watched a, a maybe I maybe I've watched two outs at the max. Um, I have looked in the morning and online, and you know you can go to the highlights. But um, no, I haven't watched. I've been kind of busy around here, and um, I know the Dodgers came back and won three straight, and Tampa Bay hung on. Houston made a nice charge and fell short. So makes for an interesting World Series. I'm sure that the that the networks would have loved Houston and in, in the Dodgers on a rematch mm-hmm. you know, with all that controversy. I'm sure they would have loved that. But, you know, Tampa Bay is not impressive when they played us and beat us two out of three at home. And you look at their lineup and you go, how in the hell do they win? Uh, but they do. And, you know, I just think that, I think the Dodgers got to be a prohibitive favorite here for some reason or other, you know? Um, yeah. The Rays keep winning, but I, I agree with you. Uh, what's, what's Haji yelling about? I would think that, you know, he's relaxed. He's, he's on vacation, but he still needs as much attention as ever. Apparently he's getting but, to be a spoiled brat in his old um, age. He just turned 18. Wow. Last week. Wow. So Haji, Haji's got his license. He's, he can, well, that's he right. Can he, he can have beer now. I can fit him he, beer instead of water. Well, no, he's <laughs> not legally. He can't legally drink, but he can he can go to war. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, I I first of all think if I had been you, and not to say that I didn't watch a ton of Mets this year, I watched a lot of Mets baseball, a lot of Yankees baseball for work. You were in the booth for a lot of long games, so I totally understand. You go down to Florida. You're not locked in on postseason baseball. You're enjoying yourself. You've got a bunch of things to take care of um, down there, as you mentioned. Um, and also, the Mets offseason really hasn't started yet. Uh, we don't have the official word that Steve Cohen's going to be the owner yet. Uh, we don't know who the GM or GMs will be. We just know that if Steve Cohen gets hired, Sandy Alderson will be the president. The, the thing that Mets fans are talking about, though, Keith, is this idea of Basically, Trevor Bauer and JT Realmuto are out there. And if they're going to have this owner that's worth $14 billion, uh, they would at least like to be on the, in on the mix uh, for these guys, considering you know this is the first offseason of an owner who can afford everybody and would do something like that. Um, do you, what do you think of the idea of going after a, a big free agent pitcher like a Trevor Bauer if you're the Mets? Well, it's certainly a need for the Mets. I mean, uh, Waka and uh, the sinker baller. Parcello did not work out. Um, they did not pitch well. Syndergaard's not going to be back probably till the All-Star break. You know, you got a whole 80, you know, the, there's more games in the first half than the second half. So you're probably talking close to 90 games without Syndergaard. Uh, they're, they're shallow. They're short. I mean, that would be a priority. I always said pitching is number one priority for me. I'll, I'll take a, a good pitching staff over uh, a big bashing lineup. Um, preferably, you'd want both. But um, if you had your druthers, you'd want the pitching. So, yes, that's a need. I mean, how old is Bauer? Is Bauer in his 30s? Is he in his early 30s? I think, I he think he's maybe 30 but in his late 20s but i'm going to check here okay. he's they're always in good shape these guys he doesn't seem to have arm problems he's um, 29 okay so he doesn't appear to have arm problems um 
he's got great stuff. He's a little bit of a loose cannon, but that's okay. I like guys like that. Um, so sure, if I if I would be my number one priority would be bolstering the bullpen and the and the starting rotation, basically the pitching staff. I it's funny that you know we talked about the Rays going into this, and it ends up being about the Mets, obviously. But um, when you did the first game, I think it was at home against the Rays. I remember you saying, you know, I looked at this lineup and I don't know any of these names. Right. And the Rays, even though you haven't watched, I'm sure you know, they have won with uh, guys coming out of the bullpen who throw really hard, three really good starting pitchers, and they catch everything. Right. And it's kind of like you're looked at as old school if you say, well, good pitching and defense can win. But they're proving that if you build your team around those things, you beat a team like the Yankees. Like, you know, the Yankees, you saw them a bunch this year. That's Judge and Stanton and Sanchez and Voigt. A lot of long balls, not a lot of, you know, ground balls second to move the runner over. But the Rays just have the ability to do that, those smaller things, Keith. And I'd like to see a little bit more of that from the Mets and their roster. Well, um, there's a lot of there's drastic changes in the game, but they're still basics. The keys to winning and defense is one of them. And, you know, you just, there's a lot of batting cage major leaguers. That's what I call them out there that, you know, that that's where they're going to make their money. They never get out of the batting cage and they don't know how to run bases. So, I'm not saying everybody, or they're not good fielders, but there's always been bad base runners and bad fielders in, in going back, you know, when the game started. So, uh, but it just seems more prevalent now. Um, I just, um, the Yankees just fell short, but they didn't have the pitching. And we go back. That's the common denominator. There you go. It's square one. That's where I build a team. I build a team with good pitching. You look at the 69 Mets. You look at that lineup of 69 Mets. You had Wayne Garrett hit un, uh, under 200. You know, uh, Weiss hit 210 or 212. Uh, they didn't have a lot of hitters on that. They had, they had to rely on Cleon. And when they got Clendenin, that was a boost. But they had extraordinary pitching. So that's where I'd start. Yeah. Um, you would have, I don't know if you read about this play, you would have lost it last night if you had been in the booth because the Braves had second and third, nobody out and what grounded, inning? Into a, grounded into a double play. I forget what inning it was, but it was a grounder. Well, it, to, well, it was second and third. You said how it was, was the bases loaded? No, second and third. And they grounded into a double play. They, it was a rundown with the runner at third who got tagged out. Okay. And then, so the runner at second tried to go to third during the rundown and got tagged out. Too. He it should was, never be, that guy should never be tagged out. If it's a contact play and the runner at third goes on contact, the back runner also knows there's a sign uh, that the, so the back runner knows that on contact, the lead runner at third is running. So you break on a ball on the ground too. And I mean, unless it was a abracadabra, magic rundown you go to third base and you just hold anchor there and the only the only element that can come into play is the the guy who hit the ball you might get a double play with him you know going trying to go to second but never at third i, I didn't see it i'm glad i didn't see it it would have probably yeah. ruined i uh, probably had it was during dinner a nice red wine would have ruined it <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You wouldn't have been able to relax. Um, by the way, we have a bunch of uh, questions from uh, some of our listeners and, and folks on, on Twitter and Facebook to get to. We'll get to that in a second. First, I just want to quickly promote um, SNY 6 o'clock uh, on weeknights is a little show called Baseball Night in New York. I know Keith sits through a bunch of these promos with Gary Cohen during the season. Uh, we talk Mets, Yankees, uh, everything baseball. Uh, we've talked about all the teams in the postseason a little bit and also all the big stories and how they end up uh, circling back to the Mets and the Yankees certainly should be an interesting offseason. We'll be with you all offseason baseball night in New York. Uh, it, it's myself hosting, but we have um, former uh, Mets and uh, Anthony Recker and Jim Duquette, as well as a bunch of uh, great writers, Andy Martino, John Harper, Anthony McCarron. Uh, and opinion, uh, guys like Salicata, Mark Melusis, Stan Grouse, and John Hine. It's a fun show, uh, weeknights at 6 on SNY. So, Keith, let's get to uh, some of these fan questions. Um, I want to start with um, maybe the, the most important of the bunch. This is from Tyler. What is the best product that you use to maintain a pristine mustache? Oh, gosh. I, there's no product you can use. I mean, 
it's all about the trim. So you get a nice little, little electric razor or battery powered, and you just, you know, unless you want to have a big walrus mustache, which I think is unruly. Don't you think walruses look unruly? I, I, do. I do. They are unruly, but you know, uh, they're walruses. I always like to keep it trim, you know, above the upper lip, and um, and I angle it here. It's it takes around five minutes. I'm kind of a little bit. Um, I don't want to say that word, but uh, I can get real meticulous and uh, get in front of that mirror. So I don't use any product other than, you know, you know that my mustache is totally gray. And I did remember I did all those just for men commercials. I, I still use just for men. Um, right now, it looks like I might need a little more right now. Well, that's what Jerry, that. Jerry was giving you a hard Brown. time because you, uh, <laughs> Jerry gave you a hard time because you did all those ads and it doesn't look like you're, you're using the product much anymore, but I, I like the gray look. I think, uh, I think it's, it makes it's, me look uh, old. It's just amazing. I'll say one thing is that when I do color it, I, I, I look younger, obviously, cause I'm not, I'm not, I don't have the gray mustache, but you know, it makes you, it's funny how visual it makes you feel younger when you look hmm. at yourself in the mirror uh, for some reason, not that I sit home all day and look at myself in the mirror. I don't do that. Jeff, uh, we want to just make clip this off and see if uh, Just for Men would like to do uh, the sponsorship of the podcast. It might you know fit like a glove. Um, <laughs> all right, this is from um, at Real Doug Fryer, uh, a fellow Doug. He asks Alonzo Smith, Davis, Rosario, Cano, and Jimenez. Who plays? Who stays? Who plays where? And who goes? That's a pretty easy question, Keith. Uh, you know, the Mets need a lot. And I always feel a general manager, you know, unless you've got um, the greatest player in the game who plays for the California Angels, their center fielder, he's an untouchable. Um, I think with the Mets, I think you, you were open to anybody. So anybody that comes and sees what, see what you can get. To, so for me, uh, that would be Pete Alonzo. I would listen to see what, what would if people were interested in Alonzo, probably, uh, well, I was going to say American League teams, but we're probably going to have a DH next year in the National League. I'm sure that's going to be instituted, and that'll be a given for now on, but we don't know that yet. Um, and Pete really is an ideal uh, DH. And, you know, and uh, Dom has got a, a good glove at first. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I would float – uh rosario out there i would float i mean no one's gonna want to take cano you never know but cano could still play okay he had a good mm -hmm. year and he can still hit um so i would be open to any and every offer because you never know what you're going to put together i mean what you, you would a rosario and alonzo uh you know a package uh, be attractive to another team and where do you want to go do you are we are we here to win now which the Mets seem to be under pressure to do because they're in New York. Uh, or do you look for younger talent that's, you know, coming through the pipeline and not necessarily triple a players. I mean, it all depends on your scouting too. I mean, the Braves do a great job of scouting all the teams that win. They have, they have good organizational at all levels. Um, I'd be interested to see what Steve Cohn does as far as not, what's in the spotlight, what he does as far as structurally uh, making this organization uh, hum on all cylinders. Uh, so the decision will be, okay, do we get young talent? Or are we going to play to win much like in 85 when we got Gary Carter? I mean, Gary didn't have very many years left and they knew that his knees were going, but he was the final piece. But our club is, was so much all, we were just missing one piece. This team is very young. Uh, and it's missing a, a lot of pieces. Uh, but the core, I love the young core. So uh, it's a tough decision for, for Sandy Alderson. He hasn't even hired a general manager yet. We don't know if he's going to do that. Uh, who's who's going to be the general manager? They got to get their, get it going on because the winter meetings are right around the corner. It's interesting you talk about scouting, Keith. We, you know, we didn't have a minor league season. I know. So, you know, you go and you try and make a trade. Uh, if you're offered prospects for somebody who's already established, I mean, how do you, you know, have you had eyes on that player? I mean, you've been scouting him, you know, playing on side fields somewhere and not against competition. I don't know. 
Uh, but you're right about Alonzo being an ideal DH. You're right about the fact that maybe the Mets have the DH next year anyway. But the Mets are better off to me having flexibility at that position and being able to cycle guys in and out and giving them half days off. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure they're built to have an everyday DH. And I don't know if Pete would even want to be that. So um, I could see him having a big uh, comeback year. And, I, I um, can too. I agree. Yeah. So, so I believe in the sophomore jinx. So, it's, yeah. you know, and I've, I've said it on the air. Uh, I've explained why it's all mental. It's nothing else. It's obvious that Pete uh, pressed all year long and uh, you know, I've been there. So I understand. I mean, I had my first good year, my breakout year in 77 and the next year I hit uh, 255. I don't, I can't explain it. And then I had the MVP year. So, you know, go figure. Well, I want to give Diane M credit. She asked, uh, what is the biggest thing uh, Keith saw Pete regress at at the plate um, that attributed to his poor sophomore year? Uh, Even though the power was still there, he looked different. Do you, do you think that it was something that you, and actually, you know what, I'll connect it to this other question from Irene. Uh, Did you ever act like a, a hitting coach to any of the Mets, specifically Pete Alonso? So when you talked to Pete, did you, would it ever come out of your mouth to give him pointers? Would, it, would you ever see that as something that you could, you know, input in a conversation with him while he's struggling? There's different philosophies. I had the phone calls with the players during the season and Pete. And with them, it's all about the computer and the video and the analytics. I don't know. Okay, pitcher X does this and two and one, three and two. Uh, but, you know, when I always knew how the pitcher, I always just went back here. But I, mean, I know that my generation didn't grow up with computers. This generation has grown up with computers. So they are into it. I wouldn't be able to be a hitting coach today because you have to be hip to all the, all the different statistics that are analytics, all these names they have. Um, you've got to look into the video. Um, I think it's too much. I think there's certain basics. Pete, in answer to the one question, was under everything all year long. And I made a point of that, saying that. He was swung right under everything. He was swinging from his rear end, and he got out of the strike zone. They just pounded him in, and with the ball moving in, and it would start out a strike, right, that much a strike, and it would be that much a ball, and he'd swing at it. They'd throw him a breaking ball that much a strike, and it'd be out here ball. Well, let me give you this. So it's that much a strike on the plate. It'd be that much out here off, off the outside corner. And he'd be swinging, and that's pressing. So he, he got out of, of, of the uh, strike zone. Now, he did do better the last you know road trip. He hit the home runs. Okay, great. The horses were out of the barn, but at least let's be positive about it. And another thing, too, is um, – this generation of players, they're all very positive. And, you know, if I'm hitting 190 in July, I'm not going to be a whole fountain of po- a positive thought. You know, I'm going to be shaken to my boots. And when I talked to Pete, it was like, you know, I'm ready to come out of it. And, and I'm going, okay. You know, so that's a good thing. Uh, but there's certain realities in life, too. You can't bullshit. A bull- <laughs> I like that. I'm curious to see if our uh, our production team decides to bleep that or leave it as is. I'll, I'll let them decide. Um, we got a couple more questions. I think the first two uh, you've addressed is there an available superstar the Mets could acquire this offseason that could propel them to a World Series run like Mike Piazza or Cespedes. Um, is, is anything come to mind, Keith, or do you think that they just need to build around the court? What are our needs? Catcher is a primary need. Yeah, Real Muto is Real Muto a Piazza? I don't think so. He's a good, very, very good player, very good defender. He's very athletic behind the plate. He hustles. I like that. He runs everything out. Um, he's a competitor, uh, but he kind of reminds me—he's out of the same mold of John Stearns. He's a very athletic catcher. He can steal the base, run. Uh, he could throw. He's a good defensive catcher, um, and he's a good hitter. Uh, but uh, he's going to be what 32 
or something like that, you know, there's, and he's going to want a long-term deal. You're going to give him five years. You're going to give him until he's 37, 36. I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, and he's a he kind gets, of body too that he, I mean, he won't get hurt, but catchers get worn down. Well, I was about to say, what's to say that in spring training, the second game of the spring, if foul tip breaks his, you know, pointer finger on his right hand, you know, like being a catcher is just a tough spot to, you know, really try and, and sign the superstar player that's going to propel you on a run because it's such a physically demanding position. Um, Let me interrupt one thing here. Uh, which I just thought of. We all like the offense going in. Conforto seems to, I think Conforto's found himself. He's come into his own. He, he is, I, I can't say it's a breakout year. He had 30 home runs two years ago. But I think he's come into now, he's matured into a really, he's one of the elite players. Cano uh, uh, can hit. I like our lineup. If Pete can come back, and I don't mean 52 home runs, I'll take 30 home, 250, 30 home runs, drive in 100 runs. He didn't hit in the clutch last year at all. That lineup is formidable and it's well balanced. So my focus would be on, because uh, there's such a need, uh, I would focus on pitching keep the guys in the game and hope that, you know, the offense uh, would, would, would carry it on their end. And obviously too, the other key is uh, we, we need a catcher. Ramos is not going to be back on um, the other two guys. Nito, they're, 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 they're not starters. And I, I don't think that they're going to be able to, to start a full season. I think they'd break down their backup catchers. Sounds a little bit like someone's getting a, a root canal in the next room. Keith. Uh, that's the automatic, uh, litter machine over there so, sorry about that <laughs> haji haji's got haji. the the sharper image the sharper image litter machine i like oh, it hold on there he is he's on his he's on his window seat uh hey. must be i just got a great he's got a nice life yes he does um okay last last one uh well that question was from kevin mccarthy uh kevin lenda biggest need in the offseason i think we got to that uh, let's see, Irene, we got Diane, we got, um, G Bucky. What are the biggest changes Steve Cohen will need to make as a Met owner? What areas should he attack first and who would you like to see him bring in, um, executives, coaches, players, you have any thoughts on maybe the off the field stuff that you think he should focus on? No, I think he's already done one good move and that's going uh, Sandy Alderson as president. I think that, uh, Sandy's a good baseball guy. Uh, he's been with the Oakland A's, but had you no know, that were burdened by finance, and they find a way to win. They still do to this day. Uh, it's to their credit. Um, so I think Alderson is a great move on his part. And as an owner, I think obviously all roads lead to Rome, and Steve Cohn will be Rome. Um, but he's the one that's got the pocketbook and the checkbook. So uh, I would hire quality baseball people at the top you got one in alderson uh we'll see what sandy does on his end uh, it's going to be very interesting this like you said when we started to show up but this off season is it's going to happen rapidly it's got to happen rapidly they've got to have something in place you know a good month before uh, uh going into uh, the winter meetings um we got a question from liam hanrahan and it's interesting because we talked to you the day after Tom Seaver had passed and you gave us some, some great memories and stories about him. But Liam asked, would Keith like to share any Tom Seaver memories? Have you had conversations since then? Memories? Talk to any of your former teammates? Anything that like maybe you hadn't thought about in a long time and, and his passing brought back or anything else you, you want to add in terms of uh, maybe something that our listeners would appreciate or enjoy? Well, I have always, I have one fond memory and, and uh, well, not one, but the biggest one. And number one is that I got to play with him, even though for a very short period of time. And that would have been that 83 season. Um, and I remember I had a ground ball, routine ground ball, hitting the hole at Shea Stadium. And it was too far for me to run tag to bag. And so I got the ball to my right. And I always run towards the runner. It wasn't a fast runner, so I could shovel pass and running to the to Tom. And as I'm running, I'm around 10 feet away from him. And I go, I can't believe that I'm tossing a ball to Tom Seaver. 
And Tom caught the ball and then looked over and tagged the bag and said, you better believe it, Sonny. I'll never forget <laughs> that. <laughs> so we had fun. I have that's a, that's a very fond memory because we were both veterans. He was obviously, he was in that, that group 10 years older than me. So when I came up when I was 20, they were in their prime. These were the guys that were in their prime. Pete Rose, Tom Seaver, Carlton. Um, they were all right in just in the best at, uh, time of their career. Tom was getting a little on, but uh, uh, he still had many good years left. Unfortunately, they weren't in the orange and blue. We've we've lost a lot, a lot of oh. you know, former legends. I mean, uh, to not have Bob Gibson and, and oh, Joe Morgan. I mean, well, let me tell you about Joe. Joe was the greatest player that I ever played with or against. There was no one. I don't see anybody in today's game that can do the things that he did. He was five nine. He can run like a deer. He can steal a base. He was a hell of a second baseman. Won a Gold Glove. Uh, 300 hitter. I don't know if it's lifetime. I don't think it is lifetime, but in his, when he was with the big red machine, he hit 330. He hit, he hit 30 home runs. He drove in a hundred runs. He walked a hundred times plus, and he scored a hundred runs. And he was the most electrifying player of, of my, of my, of my playing time, my 17 years in the big leagues. And I'm very happy that I went to a gold glove meeting uh, dinner in New York two years ago or last, might have been last winter. And I got to sit at the table with Joe and I got to tell him that. And I know he wasn't doing well, he was on a cane and um, uh, he had a very big smile and he was a kind of an infectious personality. And um, I got to tell him that, you know, in my estimation, you were the greatest player. And he just, he, he loved that. He said, he said, I'm in a handful of players tell him that. He says, I always yeah. love to hear it. Oh, who wouldn't? He was just such a great player. He hit third. He hit a line yeah. drive over my head one time. He's a pool hitter too. And he hit, when, and when Stargell came up or McCovey and I'm holding a runner on AstroTurf at Bush Stadium, I got to have my glove down on that turf if they connect on one. Even John Milner, he was a dead pool hitter. But Joe, Joe hit a line drive over my head off Pete Falcone one time uh, at Bush Stadium that I didn't get my glove up. I was holding the runner on, the gloves down. I went to go up and I just quit because the ball was already in right field. It was more over my head. That's how hard he hit it. I'll, I'll, I, I have a visual of that ball with kind of, we pulled it and it kind of hooked right over my head. And I didn't get my glove up in time. So um, he was a great player, a really uh, great guy. And we just lost so many Hall of Famers. Yeah. yeah we lost Whitey too. And I, I, Joe Morgan's stance was the first stance that I ever saw like my dad do in the backyard and you oh, know, yeah, I was had the, the back elbow the elbow yeah and and my I grew up impersonating you know Gary Sheffield and I, I Joe Morgan too Sunday night baseball at least as a kid for me was uh you know the first baseball appointment viewing every Sunday night didn't matter who was playing I watched and John Miller Joe Morgan uh, were the voices of that night and in baseball in my childhood and um, I really thought he was good at what he did and and you do the same job. So I'm sure you listen to him and, um, it's cool that you guys were able to have that conversation. Uh, well, it was, it was good that when they started getting Tony Kubek was probably one of the first Rizzuto ex players becoming the analysts, the guys that played and then yeah. it just progressed. I think McCarver took it to a different level when, when Tim came in. Yeah. Um, well, that's great stuff, Keith. And, um, it's, it's great to talk to you. Glad you're doing well down in Florida and, um, you, you alluded to it. It's going to be a busy off season. So we'll get you and yeah. Haji back on the, we'll get you and Haji back on the horn, uh, at some point in the next month. And we'll talk more once the, the world series over the, the, you know, the Mets off season will progress. We'll have news on, uh, Steve Cohen and whether he's officially yeah. been, uh, accepted by the owners. And from there, I'm sure it'll be crazy. Well, I'm at your disposal. I got all the time in the world on my hands for the next uh, four, five and a half months. So if I'm here, just a phone call away. Get uh, get like that chiropractor. Baseball, phone call away. Get some uh, some two a days from that chiropractor, and we'll be seeing you soon. Oh, and I'm working out too now. I got my second workout today. I got to lose twelve pounds. Ugh, that's gonna be rough. 
All right, Keith. Thank you. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you.